a young child so there is unfused epiphysis so you can see the cartilage that is a growth plate in between and similarly there is a lateral radiograph here you can see other structures which are better seen that is patella and the tibial tuberosity which you can see uh, best on the lateral radiograph uh, one more important view for knee joint is the skyline view of patella that is you can see the patellofemoral articulation very nicely so if there is any patellofemoral arthritis or any osteophyte you can see it very nicely on this view so these are the main three views which are used for the knee joint radiograph but these are this where the normal radiograph this is a very common appearance what we see in elderly patients who have osteoarthritic changes there must there is almost complete obliteration of the medial compartment joint space and there is also some varus deformity because of the medial compartment joint space the knee is bent medially so there is the deformity with severe osteoarthritic changes why medial compartment is more affected because the our weight bearing is more on the medial compartment compared to the lateral compartment that is why it is usually more commonly affected in cases of osteoarthritis so if you compare it with the normal knee joint where the joint space is preserved here there is loss of joint space and there are presence of osteophytes also so radiograph gives us indirect signs of injuries that is uh, degenerative changes because of the loss of articular cartilage but it does not give details of soft tissue injury like cruciate ligaments meniscus collateral ligaments all these injuries cannot be detected on radiograph it is good for detection of fractures particularly in patients of trauma or some bony lesions or bone tumors but other than that for almost everything mr is much more sensitive even for detection of osseous injuries when radiograph is normal even in certain patients when ct scan is normal mri can still give extent of osseous injuries that is in form of bone marrow edema or contusions when there is no fracture there is only edematous changes in the bone marrow that is better detected with the help of mri the only thing where x-ray scores over mri is diagnosis of primary bone tumors where mr can help in diagnosing extent of the lesion but the characteristic of the lesion or the primary diagnosis of bone tumor is almost always on a radiograph only and not on mri so mr is most important imaging modality for evaluation of knee joint because it can give us extent of soft tissue as well as bony injuries uh, what are some prerequisites for mr imaging we should have a good mr magnet uh, usually now almost all magnets are at least 1.5 tesla strength some are 3 tesla with 3 tesla we get even more better resolution but even 1.5 is enough for more, most practical purposes we need good contrast we need good spatial resolution and that can be obtained with the help of a dedicated knee coil this is how the knee coil looks like the knee joint is placed it can be opened up and the patient's leg can be placed on this and this covers the knee joint is important to do with small field of view imaging and with higher metrics where is the another coil which is the flexible coil or flex coil which can be used for almost multiple bone body parts so some people who again all these things are associated with extra cost or expenses these are extremely expensive gadgets so many people who don't purchase this knee coil then they try to do mr with this flexible coils and you do you do get mr images but usually the image quality is not as good as what you get with this dedicated knee joint coil same for the shoulder same for the wrist there are different coils for uh, almost all of the major joints that is why you are seeing if you are seeing different uh, mr films of from different centers some might be looking very clear so and some you feel that the image quality is not very proper because either the proper coil is not used proper sequences are not used or if you try to do with large field of view that is every joint has a specific uh, field of view which is designated that it ideally it should be done in this size if you try to do mri of uh, almost half of femur with half of tibia along with knee joint the resolution will be very poor yes. hello hello everyone please check your microphone it should be turned off it creates a disturbance in between the lecture Yes, sir. You continue, sir. I think one of uh, the microphone is on. Yeah. So, patient is placed in supine position with little bit of external rotation. 
and please remember we can do only one knee joint at a time we can do both hip joints simultaneously but that is not true for the knee joint it has to be a single knee joint examination for right and left knee we have to do complete separate two mri studies for both the knee joints we can't do it together otherwise we don't get the details so as i said the field of view should be large enough to include all important structures we don't want to uh, do a MRI of knee joint with very small field of view where we miss looking at the tibial tuberosity. So all important structures should be covered, but at the same time, it should be small enough to give us high resolution images. As we increase in the field of view, the resolution decreases. For knee joint, the ideal field of view is around 14 centimeter. And we take images which are almost three to four millimeter thick. Now even we take some 3D sequences, which are uh, a zero millimeter gap with continuous images, just like CT scan. There are different sequences which are used for knee joint. The most important one are the T1 weighted, T2 weighted, proton density, and stir or spur, which is the fat suppressed images. And we take the sequences in different imaging planes, that is axial, coronal, sagittal, or sometimes oblique coronal, particularly for the anterior cruciate ligament. Uh, pertaining to the yesterday's questions about TR and TE, the TR and TE, they decides the sequences. Like Each sequences has their specific TR and TE. That is, uh, maybe to make it a little simpler, uh, the MR sequences are different radio frequencies pulses. So these radio frequency pulses are generated by the MR machines, which goes inside the patient's body. They deposit their energy in the patient's hydrogen atoms, the hydrogen atoms which are in abundance in our body, right? So these hydrogen atoms, they get this energy from these radio frequency pulses then different body structures the hydrogen atoms they release the energy at different times like for example fat releases energy very slowly while water releases energy immediately so when this energy is released at that time this released energy is again detected by the mri coils which are placed on that body part and again all these computerized uh, calculation they ultimately give us the mr images so these characteristic give us the different appearances of different structures of our body so if we come to the tr and te the t1 weighted images are short te short tr that is the te is time to echo that is the, the radio frequency pulse is given for that short duration of time and tr is time of repetition that is given at certain interval time uh, if you imagine uh, maybe a bell buzzer if you press the buzzer for five seconds time and then repeat that same action at every 40 seconds press it for five seconds then you stop it then again after 40 seconds you press it for five seconds and you release it if you do it continuously right this is what the mr machine does for that five seconds time for which the buzzer is pressed that is known as the te that is the time to echo and the 40 seconds time which, at, which is the interval at which the buzzer is pressed, that is the TR or time of repetition. So if every 40 seconds you are pressing it for five seconds, that is five seconds is your TE, 20, 40 seconds is your TR, but here it is in milliseconds. So in T1 weighted, it is short TE, short TR, that is around uh, 15 to 20 milliseconds is the TE. The TR is around 600 to 700 milliseconds while in t2 weighted it is long tr long te where tr is more than 2000 te is around 90 to 100 the proton density is a sequence which is combination of t1 and t2 and this is very good sequence for the all musculoskeletal imaging this is the main sequence of msk imaging in proton density has combination of t1 and t2 that is short te and long tr so that is the character it is more of physics, but uh, I thought you might be interested in knowing at least some basics about the TR and T, right? So uh, MR protocol, every center or every person has its own protocol to look at the MR images. Everyone is comfortable with different sets of sequences, but most important is you should have some axial. We, we use usually proton density with fat suppression in axial, two sagittal, one uh, fat suppressed PD, one non fat suppressed PD. We take two coronal, one is fat suppressed T2 and one is non fat suppressed T1. And we also take oblique coronal, particularly when the question is for the anterior cruciate ligament. The knee joint has so many structures to be looked at that unless you have a systemic approach, there are all chances that you might miss on certain lesions. 
for example if you see an anterior cruciate ligament tear you see a medial meniscus tear then you tend to uh, overlook other structures like medial collateral ligament injuries there or uh, which might be missed if you have an acl tear with meniscus tear so it is good to have a checklist so when you feel all these uh, places then you are sure that you are looking at all important structures of the knee joint which make your reporting more precise right. uh, starting with the meniscus the menisci they are the c-shaped structures within the knee joint between the femoral condyle and tbl plateau it has three segments the anterior horn the body and the posterior horn the main imaging plane for the evaluation of knee joint is the sagittal plane, where you can see the meniscus very nicely. This is the anterior horn of the meniscus. This is the posterior horn of the meniscus. Then the complementary plane is coronal. So if you see any abnormality in the sagittal plane, you should check it in the coronal plane so that you can confirm whether it is artifactual or because of partial volume or it is ab actual abnormality. The axial plane is least useful because it is affected by the partial volume averaging. But if your sections are going perfectly through the meniscus, then this is the only imaging plane where you can see the entire meniscus in single image. Can you see this? This is the C-shaped medial meniscus like this. So when you take the sagittal images, insert in the lateral cuts, you can see the entire meniscus. But when you take sequence from here, then you can see the anterior horn. Then there is some gap in between. And then you see the posterior horn like here. You are seeing anterior horn, then there is some gap, then there is the posterior horn. And it is also helpful in evaluate, evaluation of certain tear like the bucket handle tear of the medial meniscus. So that you can see nicely on the axial plane. This is the lateral meniscus. Again, C-shaped structure like this. This is the appearance of lateral meniscus on axial image. The medial meniscus has anterior and posterior horn which are asymmetrical in size. If you look carefully, the anterior horn is smaller compared to the posterior horn uh, throughout all the images. So the posterior horn has to be larger in case of medial meniscus. What is the importance? If you see a medial meniscus which has posterior horn which is almost same size of anterior horn or smaller than anterior horn, then you should think that there is some meniscal tear. Even if you don't see a tear, try to search for the tear. There has to be one. Unless that is that can be the only reason when the meniscus is posterior horn is smaller. So most likely there could be a flap tear. That is the small uh, loss of some meniscal substance, which gives you smaller appearance of the meniscus. While on the lateral meniscus, if you compare both, both the horns are almost symmetric. So the anterior and posterior horn are of same size in case of lateral meniscus. Uh, it is important to know the attachments of the meniscus. The medial meniscus has open C shape. That is the anterior attachment and posterior attachments are far apart. The anterior horn or anterior attachment of medial meniscus is almost at the level of joint capsule, while the posterior attachment is just anterior to the posterior cruciate ligament attachment. While the lateral meniscus, it has very tight C shape. That is, it, it, it is like this. So the anterior and posterior attachments are very much close together. So you should know where the meniscus attaches. Why? Because if you are looking at your images or the sagittal plane and you see a posterior horn of medial meniscus, which is at the level of posterior cruciate ligament or behind the posterior cruciate ligament, then you should suspect that there is some tear at its posterior attachment. Otherwise, it should be between the lateral meniscus and the posterior cruciate ligament. So this is the importance of knowing the sites of attachment of medial and lateral meniscus. <laughs> the other important thing is the medial meniscus, as I said, it has open C shape and it is very firmly attached with the joint capsule. So the medial meniscus and the capsule both are very firmly adherent. While in case of lateral meniscus, it is loosely attached. So there is some gap in between the lateral meniscus and the joint capsule. So the medial meniscus is less mobile because it is more fixed with the joint capsule. And that is why it is more prone to the tear. Lateral meniscus is a little bit free. So it is less prone to injury. Other important thing is the medial side compartment has more weight bearing. So again, that is more prone to injury. That is why you will see the medial meniscus injuries more frequent than the lateral meniscus injuries. Uh, meniscal vascularity. Again, I'm showing you all these things apart from the meniscal tears because it is very much important to understand these things before we go to the meniscal tears. Meniscus has 
vascularity only in its outer one third. Its middle part one third has minimum vascularity and its inner one third part is completely avascular. So if there is a tear of meniscus which occurs in its inner one third or inner two third part, even if we try to repair that tear with meniscal suturing, that repairing the that that will not be successful because there is no blood supply to heal that suture. So a tear which is in the outer one third that can be sutured, but a tear which is occurring in medial two third of the meniscus, it has to be only a partial meniscectomy has to be done. You cannot suture it because it will not heal. So there is no purpose of repairing that tear. But in the outer one third, it can be repaired. So again, it is important to tell whenever there is a meniscus tear, it is important to note whether it is in the outer one third or it is in the inner two third because that will change the patient's management. A meniscus structures, meniscus is formed by the fibro, uh, different fibers and all these collagen fibers, they are arranged in three types of fibers. One is the circumferential fiber, which run from the anterior to posterior. There are radial fibers, which run from medial to lateral. And there are some random fibers, which are haphazardly arranged. <clears throat> you can imagine maybe meniscus as a three dimensional structure. You can imagine a, maybe a banana like thing. And so it is like C shaped structure. So if a tear, which is in this plane, which is the horizontal tear, if you see this tear, it does not have to break any of the meniscal fibers, the radial fibers and the circumferential fibers. It can occur only in between because there is no fiber which is going from superior to inferior, right? So it does not have to break any of the fibers. So these horizontal tears can occur with minimum injury or minimum force. So this tear can be seen in degenerative changes or the degenerative meniscal tear. But when there is a tear, which is either a radial or a longitudinal tear which occur either in this fashion this is the where how the radial tear occurs so for the radial tear to occur it has to break through this circumferential fibers so it requires significant force or trauma again longitudinal tear it occurs in this plane it divides the meniscus in the inner and outer part so for this tear to occur it has to break through these radial fibers so again it requires significant force so the radial tear and the longitudinal tear, they require significant force. And that is why they are seen almost always in patients of trauma. While the horizontal tears, it does not require significant force. So they can be seen in degenerative changes. Right? So after some of these basic things, we are coming to the imaging of meniscus. What are the criteria of meniscal tear? There are two simple criteria for meniscal tear. One is the abnormality of shape of the meniscus. Second is the abnormality of the signal intensity of the meniscus. Out of these two, the abnormality of shape is much more reliable criteria than abnormality of signal intensity because signal intensity can be very much non-specific. But whenever there is abnormality of shape of the meniscus, that almost always suggests that there is some meniscal tear. The tears can be basically two types either horizontal tear or a vertical tear. And the vertical tear can again be either longitudinal or radial. I'll show you the examples. And complex tear is when there is combination of all these different types of tears. How do we grade the meniscal tear? Grade one is a focal hyperintensity in the meniscus. When you see such kind of hyperintensity, which is very subtle, this is not even a grade one signal. This is just normal meniscal vascularity, which is very common in the young individuals. And this is very, commonly mi misreported as a meniscal tear, but it is not a meniscal tear. While you see such kind of hyperintensity in the meniscus, this is the grade one signal. Again, this is not termed as tear because if you, if the surgeon does arthroscopy, he will not be able to see this because this is only within the substance of the meniscus. The arthroscope can go see the superior margin, the inferior margin, the free edge of the meniscus, but not what is happening inside the meniscus. So this is termed as only grade one signal, which is the degeneration of meniscus. Grade two is a linear horizontal hyperintensity. It is reaching up to margin, but not up to the femoral or tibial articular margin. It is only reaching up to the capsular margin. So again, this will also be not seen on the arthroscopy and this is also not termed as tear. This is only termed as grade two signal. So grade one and grade two are signal. Only we term it as tear when it is grade three. That is when it is reaching up to any one of the articular margin or up to the free edge because then it will be seen on the arthroscopy, right? So this 
hyper intensity which is reaching up to the tibial articular margin this is the appearance of grade 3 meniscal tear exception is in certain times when grade 2 signal is there if it is associated with paramenisical cyst then we can term it as grade 2 tear so that is the only time when grade 2 can be termed as tear otherwise grade 1 and grade 2 are only termed as signals grade 3 is when we can tell it as a meniscal tear this is mainly to facilitate the arthroscopist because if we write it as a grade 2 tear and the surgeon does arthroscopy he does not find anything there is some abnormality of meniscus but it is not practically very much important and it will not be seen on arthroscopy so he will come out saying that okay you have mentioned it in the report as grade 2 tear but there was nothing abnormal in the meniscus the meniscus was normal and we don't want the patient to unnecessarily go under arthroscopy so we clearly tell that it is just grade 2 signal and not a tear if it is grade 3 then it is a tear so what do you see abnormal here if you see the anterior and posterior horn of meniscus you can see there is a vertical hyper intensity in the posterior horn and if i scroll through the images this vertical hyper intensity is dividing the meniscus in two parts out of which the posterior part is almost of same size throughout the meniscus and this appearance if you see it in axial plane it is this is the tear through the meniscus which is dividing the meniscus in the outer part and the inner part and this is termed as the longitudinal tear or the vertical longitudinal tear this occurs along the long axis of the meniscus and as i said for this tear to occur it has to break through the radial fibers of the meniscus so again it requires significant force and this is commonly associated with acl tears you don't see such kind of tear in degenerative changes what occurs when after longitudinal tear the meniscus displaces it gives you this kind of appearance this is the most common appearance of the bucket handle tear this is the displaced longitudinal tear when after the longitudinal tear, the meniscal fragment, it flips and goes in the intracondylar region of the knee joint and that results in the bucket handle tear. It is like you can imagine it as a, a handle of the bucket opening up. So it is known as the bucket handle tear. There are different signs which are termed for the bucket handle tear. Normally what you see in the intracondylar region is only two structures, the anterior cruciate and the posterior cruciate ligament. But when you see an additional structure in the intracondylar region, always think about the bucket handle tear the signs which are described for bucket handle tear are double pcl sign because the fragment which is displaced in the intracondylar region it uh, most of the times it looks like a posterior cruciate ligament this is the normal posterior cruciate ligament this is the meniscal fragment which mimics the posterior cruciate ligament so you can see it like a two posterior cruciate ligament so this is the double pcl sign there is fragment in notch sign as i said there is an extra fragment in the intracondylar notch Apart from the ACL and PCL, that is the bucket handle tear. And there is absent bow tie sign. The normal bow tie appearance of meniscus is lost because the meniscal tissue in the body region is uh, not there and it is displaced in the intercondylar region. So all these signs are the signs of bucket handle tear. Which is this tear? If you see carefully, this is almost like a bucket handle tear where there is a longitudinal tear, the meniscus has flipped in the intracondylar region, but not just once, it has also flipped anteriorly. So uh, along with this longitudinal tear and flipping of the meniscus, there is additional capsular injury and the posterior horn of meniscus is flipped anteriorly. So there is almost no posterior horn, almost all meniscal tissue is seen at the anterior aspect. And this is known as the flipped meniscus tear. Again, it is a form of bucket handle tear where Additionally, from this longitudinal tear and flipping, there is a capsular injury also and all the meniscal tissue is either flipped anteriorly or it can be flipped posteriorly. That is the flipped meniscus tear. Okay. Now, if you look at this tear, there is a focal hyperintensity which is horizontal. The previous tear was vertical. This is the horizontal hyperintensity which is seen extending uh, from anterior to posterior and it is dividing the meniscus in superior and inferior half. This is the horizontal or cleavage tear of the meniscus. This tear uh, can occur without damage to any of the circumferential or radial fibers and that is why this can be seen in degenerative changes. And these are the tears which are most commonly associated with parameniscal cyst. Almost more than 90% of parameniscal cysts are associated with this horizontal tear. You can see here there is a parameniscal cyst. Because of this tear, the meniscal substance, it comes out and it forms such kind of cyst. 
it can also occur in the lateral meniscus and sometimes it can form a very large parameniscal cyst also so whenever you see a parameniscal cyst always look carefully for the horizontal tear okay which is this tear as i said there the criteria for meniscal tear are two one is the abnormality of signal what we saw in the previous two cases and the other is abnormality of shape if you look at this anterior horn it is perfectly triangular in shape but if you look at this posterior horn, the triangle is broken here. There is a small fragment of that triangle which is missing. There is, of course, a hyperintensity, but more importantly, a small fragment is missing. And this abnormality of shape always indicates that there is a meniscal tear. You can also see it in coronal. The triangle is missing and a small fragment is torn and it is displaced from its normal side. And this tear is known as a flap tear. You can imagine like this, a part of meniscus is torn and it can be displaced. Most commonly, the torn fragment is displaced in either menisco femoral or menisco tibial recess, or it can even go in intracondylar region, and then it acts like a loose body. So even, if, and again, there's a soft loose body, so it will not be seen on radiograph. So many patients who have this flap kind of tear, they present with locked knee joint, and you don't see any loose body on X-ray, but this locking is because of the loose fragment from this meniscus. And this can result in blunting of the meniscus. So you might see meniscus which is apparently smaller in size. So when you see a posterior horn which is smaller or almost equal to the anterior horn, then always suspect that there can be a flap tear and the small meniscal fragment is displaced. And that is why it is missing from its normal side. There can be another tear which is a flap tear, but this is a non-displaced flap tear. It is just like a horizontal tear, but it is relatively oblique. It reaches up to the free edge of the meniscus and you can see it on MRI like a hyperintensity which is oblique in orientation and it reaches up to the free edge of the meniscus again that can be associated with parameniscal cyst which is known as the oblique flap tear. Here is one tear which is better seen on the coronal images than axial images most of the times particularly when it is affecting the posterior horn. So these tears you can see here on the coronal images, there's the vertical hyperintensity, which is dividing the meniscus in two halves. This is the appearance of a radial tear. So radial tears, they occur perpendicular to the long axis of the meniscus. And you can imagine for radial tear to occur, occur, again, it has to break through the fibers of the meniscus. So it requires significant force. And these are seen in patients of trauma. And you can imagine when the radial tear has occurred, there can be displacement of the meniscal fragment. So if you cut the banana between like vertically and you keep it in two pieces then it can open up and similarly the radial tears can result in the opening up of the meniscus and you can see some gap in between the anterior horn and posterior horn when there is a radial tear at the body region of the meniscus so there is no missing meniscal fragment it's just broken and it is displaced both the torn ends are displaced this is the appearance of radial tear there is one more tear which looks like radial tear in orientation, but it is more common in the degenerative knee joint. And these tears are looking like this. It almost always occurs at the post adjacent to the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. And the sign which is classically described for these tear is the closed meniscus sign. If you see here, you are seeing the posterior horn of the medial meniscus, and if you scroll through then it suddenly disappears so you are seeing the posterior horn in one image and in the next image it suddenly disappears that is the post meniscus sign and this sign is specific for a root tear what is root tear it is actually a tear at the, the posterior root ligament there is a ligament which connects the meniscus with the intracondylar region or the intracondylar region of tibia so this ligament when it is torn results in a root tear this can result in extrusion of the meniscus so if this posterior attachment is torn then this meniscus can go out of the knee joint and there can be extrusion of the meniscus and there will be again a progression of the degenerative changes so once there is a root tear the degenerative changes occur very fast because the, that cushion of the meniscus is lost so this can be commonly associated with extruded meniscus and it results in this ghost sign on the sagittal images okay uh, focal hyperintensity which which is looking uh, again a uh, vertical in orientation looking like a longitudinal tear but if you look carefully 
there is no meniscus which is left behind posteriorly and this is which is looking like a longitudinal tear is actually a menisco capsular separation which can occur in cases of medial meniscus because the medial meniscus is firmly attached with the joint capsule so when there is a separation of the meniscus from the joint capsule it is known as the menisco capsular separation in case of lateral meniscus there won't be any menisco, menisco capsular separation because anyway it is separate only but when there is gap or when you see fluid between the medial meniscus and the joint capsule it is termed as the menisco capsular separation so this is the an, an, another type of tear which looks like a longitudinal tear okay what is abnormal here if you look at meniscus this is the medial meniscus this is the lateral meniscus which looks a little larger compared to the medial meniscus even on sagittal image as i said in the mid part you should see only anterior horn and posterior horn there should be a gap in between but here instead you are seeing a continuous meniscal tissue throughout and this appearance is known as the discoid meniscus that is the dysplastic meniscus which is instead of c shape the meniscus is like a disc and that is why you see the continuous bow tie appearance on multiple sagittal images and on coronal images you can see that there is extension of the tip of the meniscus up to the intercondylar region usually it stops here in the body part here it is reaching up to intercondylar region and this is the appearance of discoid meniscus again here there is a discoid meniscus and as these meniscus are more thick they are more prone to the injury and almost always you will see a discoid meniscus with some kind of tear here is a tear with a paramenisical cyst and you can see on sagittal image there is a continuous bow tie appearance even in the images which are obtained near the midline you are seeing this extended meniscus and which is showing a tear so instead of c shape this is a disc shaped meniscus and you are seeing a focal tear in the discoid meniscus okay what is this appearance it is all a bone like thing which is seen in the anterior horn of medial meniscus this is the meniscal ossicle that is a small focus of ossification which occur in the meniscus it can be mistaken for a loose body on radiograph of mri usually it is asymptomatic but sometimes it can cause mechanical pain because of the irritation but the importance is less main thing is you should not mistake this as a loose body this is the appearance of meniscal ossicle this is the wavy appearance of meniscus which is at, at its free edge which is known as the meniscus flounce again this is a normal variant and you should not be worried don't misinterpret this as a tear and it can be uh, changed with slight or change in the orientation of the knee joint position if you either flex the knee more or extend the knee more then this appearance will be lost so this is the normal meniscal flounce which should not be uh, misreported as a tear so after the meniscus coming to the ligaments of the knee joint there are too many ligaments but for us practically the most important are the two cruciate ligaments and the two collateral ligaments the anterior cruciate ligaments it consists of two bands there is anteromedial band and the posterolateral band so these two bands they together form the anterior cruciate ligament and because of these two bands and again these two bands have multiple layers of fibers there are three to five layers of fibers and that is why it does not have homogeneous high intense signals throughout so acl is almost always looking a little heterogeneous the more important thing is it should be parallel to this line which is the intercondylar roof or known as the dumen sets line so its orientation should be parallel to this line but it can have some heterogeneous appearance and that is why you will see so many knee joints which are reported as acl partial tear or acl edema which is not actually edema it is just normal heterogeneous appearance of the anterior cruciate ligament which is physiological because because between this uh, multiple layers of fibers there is fat there is some synovium some fluid so it gives this heterogeneous appearance to the anterior cruciate ligament which is absolutely normal and it is not a tear for acl you have to see it in all three imaging planes because it is an oblique structure so you won't be able to see it in just one imaging plane so in sagittal you see the mid part in best way for its femoral attachment the most important sequence is axial for its tibial attachment the most important sequence is coronal so whenever you're looking at anterior cruciate ligament always look it in all three imaging planes and for femoral attachment tear you should rely most on the axial images so whenever you have a doubt about whether there is a tear at femoral attachment or this is just heterogeneous appearance of anterior cruciate ligament go to your axial you are seeing this posterior cruciate ligament very nicely but the acl normal black signals are lost and this is the tear of anterior cruciate ligament at its femoral attachment 
The most common mechanism of ACL injury is the pivot shift mechanism. That is flexion, valgus, and external rotation of tibia or internal rotation of femur. And that is how the ACL gets torn. If you see in this video, when the leg is fixed and the femur rotates over the tibia, it results in the break of the anterior cruciate ligament. And this is how the ACL gets torn, particularly when the knee is partially flexed. So this is the most common mechanism of the anterior cruciate ligament tear. And if you see it in the real life scenario, this is how it occurs. The person is running and there is an impact. And oh, Sorry. So if you see this site of impact, this is the time when the anterior cruciate ligament actually gets torn. When it stuck like this, at this point of time, the ACL will, will get torn completely. So this is the pivot shift mechanism of the anterior cruciate ligament injury. There are different signs on MRI for the tear of anterior cruciate ligament. Signs can be divided into two things, primary signs and secondary signs. Primary signs are the direct signs. So whenever these any of these signs is present, that 100% suggests that there is an anterior cruciate ligament tear. That is, when you see discontinuity of the fibers, the normal black signals are completely lost. The fibers are in discontinuity. When you see abnormal orientation of the fibers, so when it is not parallel to this line and you are seeing this flattened kind of ligament, again, this is the primary sign of anterior cruciate ligament. Or when you see no ligament at all, particularly in cases of chronic injury, when you don't see any anterior cruciate ligament, that is the anterior cruciate ligament tear. <clears throat> there are many secondary signs of anterior cruciate ligament tear, which suggest that there are high chances of anterior cruciate ligament tear, but not 100%. That is posterior cruciate ligament buckling. When you see the PCL, which is buckled and become like a question mark like of appearance that is an indirect sign of anterior cruciate ligament tear so whenever you see a buckled pcl look more carefully for the anterior cruciate ligament there can be anterior translation of tibia because acl prevents this anterior translation when acl is torn there is anterior translation of tibia in relation to femur this distance between the posterior margin of femur and posterior margin of tibia is if it becomes more than eight to nine millimeter then that is the anterior to uh, anterior translation of the tibia then there is uh, many other signs like posterior PCL line, PCL curvature ratio, all are, are not practically very much important. More important is this bone contusions. When you see this kind of bone contusions, which are contusion at the anterolateral aspect of lateral femoral condyle and posterior aspect of lateral tibial condyle, this is again, this is, this is these contusions occur in pivot shift injury. So whenever you see this kind of contusions, it highly suggests that there are more chances of ACL injury. And when you see this deep lateral femoral knot sign, the normal femoral notch, if this is more deep or when there is a fracture, osteochondral fracture here, then it suggests the, again, secondary sign of intercruciate ligament tear. So the ACL tears, when you see any of these signs, all this suggests the ACL tears. ACL tear, they more commonly occur at the femoral attachment or sometimes at the mid part. The tibial attachment tears are very less common and most common injury at the tibial attachment is actually a bony injury. That is the aversion fracture of the tibial attachment of the anterior cruciate ligament. So the patient will present with classically same symptoms of ACL tear. He will have instability, a positive drawers test because the ACL is not functioning. Here the ligament itself is intact, but the attachment site of ligament is fractured. And because of this fracture, there is fracture with some displacement of this bony fragment. So when the ACL is torn and uh, when the ACL is uh, Evolved, there is a fracture at the site and there is displacement with some retraction of the ligament. The treatment is completely different for the primary ACL tear and this bony injury. So it is very much important to detect whether it is the ligament tear or it is the bony injury which is resulting in same symptoms of ligament tear. Sometimes there can be partial ACL tear. As I said, there are two bundles. So if only one bundle is torn, when the antromedial bundle is torn and the postulatal bundle is intact, then it is termed as the partial ACL tear, but it's a little tricky to detect even on MR also. Okay. What is the abnormality here? Whenever you see a small fracture like this at the lateral tibial rim, this is very much important because this is known as the SIGAN fracture and this is almost always associated with the ACL tear. So don't miss or don't overlook this small fracture at the lateral aspect of the lateral tibial condyle because this is a classic uh, injury which is almost always associated with the tear of anterior cruciate ligament. What occurs when the AC, torn ACL if it is not repaired? So a torn ACL if it, it is left alone then it may scar down to the posterior cruciate ligament. 
in about 38 percent of the cases in about 42 percent there is complete resorption of the ligament so you don't see ligament at all as we saw in the previous one case but in certain cases about 20 percent of the cases the ligament can scar down to the roof or the lateral wall of the intercondylar region so then you might see a ligament which is going up to here so it becomes extremely difficult on mri to tell that this is a torn ligament because there is some fibrosis and ligament is adhered here so unless we have the previous mri to compare with it becomes very difficult to detect that this acl was previously torn the only thing what we see on mr is relatively smaller size of the ligament compared to the posterior cruciate ligament so if it is a smaller or thinner ligament then sometimes we can suspect that this could be possibly a result of the previous injury of the anterior cruciate ligament but it is really difficult to tell even on mri also what is this appearance when you see enlarged anterior cruciate ligament with multiple fluid locules in its fibers this is the celery stock appearance which is classical of mucoid degeneration of the anterior cruciate ligament here the ligament is not torn only it is swollen with fluid locules between it many of the times it can be associated with adjacent cyst formation also so this is the mucoid degeneration of anterior cruciate ligament similarly there can be mucoid degeneration of pcl also and these occurs in patients who don't have any trauma Ideally, it is seen more in the elderly individual with degenerative changes, but we are very frequently seeing it even in young individuals also. And it can cause significant pain, particularly while flexion. So these patients have pain after some walking when they try to sit down because they uh, experience severe pain when the ACL is, there is mucoid degeneration of ACL. Now, once ACL is torn and it is repaired, then ACL graft is placed. There are many things which are to be looked at. This is actually a different, uh, maybe a, around 30 minutes separate talk, but I'll just in brief, I'll tell you what do we look for. We have to look for the graft impingement. We have to look for graft failure. That is, there is complete tear of the graft once it is placed. We have to look at the tunnels, the femoral tunnel and the tibial tunnel, whether their position is correct or not, whether they are widened or they are, their diameter is normal. We have to look for the bone plug we have to look for the fibrosis which is known as the cyclops lesion many of the times after surgery there can be fibrosis so this results in again limited flexion because of the uh, fibrosis in the whole fast fat and this is known as the cyclops lesion or sometimes there can be ganglion formation or fluid collection in the uh, bone tunnels which are placed so these are the things which are to be looked at in cases of acl graft coming to the posterior cruciate ligament the pcl is relatively simpler compared to acl because it is homogeneously hypointense again it is formed by two fibers two bundles there is the anterolateral bundle and a posteromedial bundle but they are tightly attached with each other and it has homogeneous hypointense segments and it is less frequently injured compared to the anterior cruciate ligament but sometimes you do see there is complete tear of the posterior cruciate ligament like here or more commonly what we see is the evolution fracture of the posterior cruciate ligament so you will see less frequently this appearance where the ligament itself is torn. Most of the PCL injuries are because of the evolution fractures, that is the bony fractures at its tibial attachment, this displacement and retraction of the ligament. If there is isolated PCL tear, sometimes it does not even require surgery also. It can heal on its own. So this is the PCL tear. And if you see after two years, it, it, is, it is healed with fibrosis and you cannot even make out that this ligament was torn at some time. So isolated PCL tears usually do not require surgery. They can heal on its own. Uh, medial collateral ligament, it extends from the medial femoral condyle to the uh, upper part of the tibia. The important thing to note is that its attachment is almost seven centimeter below the joint line. So your uh, field of view should be long enough to include its the a tibial attachment of the medial collateral ligament it has three fibers the outer is the crural layer middle part is the tibial collateral ligament and inner part is the menisco femoral and menisco tibial components of the uh, meniscus so all three together they form the medial collateral ligament complex a grade one injury is when you see edema which is only in the crural layer that is the outside the mcl itself so when you see edema outside this is the grade one injury you can see here it is so below attached from the joint so if you do your knee joint which is, which is stopping here then you might miss injury which is occurring at the tibial attachment grade two is when there is hyper intensity within the substance of the ligament and grade three is when there is complete disruption of the ligament you are not seeing ligament at all that is the complete tear of medial collateral ligament there is a term known as odonus triad that is a 
deadly triad of three injuries that is the meniscal tear mcl injury and anterior cruciate ligament tear when all three are present together it is known as the odonis triad so its appearance if you see it it looks like an mcl injury there is edematous changes along the mcl but if you look on axial image this is the medial collateral ligament so ligament is better only some anterior part of ligament is edema and there is edema along the medial patellar retinaculum this is known as the anteromedial corner injury so this part forms the anteromedial corner which is formed by the anterior mcl medial patellofemoral retinaculum and medial patellofemoral ligament so these are the structures which stabilize the patella so you should not misinterpret this as the mcl injury it is the anteromedial corner injury similarly the more important corner is the posterolateral corner which is formed by fibular collateral ligament the popliteus tendon and the popliteal fibular ligament these are the main structures along with this there is arcuate ligament which is condensation of the joint capsule which also forms the posterolateral corner the important thing is whenever there is anterior cruciate ligament tear if there is associated posterolateral corner injury and it is not treated then the chances of acl repair getting failed are very much higher so you have to address the plc injury or posterolateral con corner injury also whenever it is injured along with the anterior cruciate ligament this is how the structures are looked seen on mr this is the lateral collateral ligament this is the biceps femoris uh, tendon you can see here both of these they merge together and they form the uh, conjoint and then they attach at the lateral aspect of the fibula and here it is the popliteus tendon which is coming from here and this is the popliteal fibular ligament which is a ligament which is joining the tip of the fibula with the popliteus tendon so all these they together form the posterolateral corner and here you can see there is tear of the fibular collateral ligament at its femoral attachment while here there are multiple injuries the fibular collateral ligament is torn there is injury of the joint capsule and arcuate ligament and there is extravasation of fluid so because of this arcuate ligament tear and capsular injury the fluid has gone out of the joint and and there is fluid in the intermuscular region so this is the posterolateral corner injury sometimes certain ligaments they mimic meniscal tear like here it looks like a tear of the anterior horn of the meniscus but it is not so if you look in the other imaging plane then this you can see that this is actually a ligament which is connecting the anterior horn of medial and lateral meniscus and this is known as the a thin ligament which is transverse intermeniscal ligament similarly there can be a ligament posteriorly which looks like a tear of the posterior meniscus or posterior horn of the meniscus but it is actually a ligament which is known as the menisco femoral ligament menisco femoral ligament has two components that is ligament of humphrey and ligament of risberg humphrey is component which is traversing anterior to the posterior cruciate ligament the ligament of risberg is the component which is traversing posterior to the posterior cruciate ligament so these are the two components of ligament <coughs> the menisco femoral ligament ligament of humphrey and risberg why this is important because it mimics a tear so this is not a tear this is just attachment of the ligament with the meniscus so it is known as the risberg pseudo rib if you see in this image you can see here there is a ligament attachment with the meniscus which looks like a tear but it is not actually a tear it is just a ligament attachment while on the contrary here there is acl tear and there is a hyperintensity here which is actually a ligament tear, a, a meniscal tear so here is the longitudinal tear of the posterior horn of meniscus at the site of attachment of the ligament this is like here it is extending even beyond this is known as the risberg rib tear this is the pseudo tear this is the actual tear so this is what you should be able to appreciate that this is a tear not just the pseudo tear particularly when there is acl tear when there is a sense of bony contusions you should keep in mind that there can be a risberg tear and not just the uh, artifactual appearance because of the attachment of the ligament lastly something about the bones and cartilage there are multiple joints in knee joint the tibiofemoral joint it is best evaluated in coronal and sagittal plane the patellofemoral joint is best seen in the axial plane imaging plane and you should look for bone marrow edema or contusions also look for the cartilage injuries it is graded as grade 0 is the normal articular cartilage this is the patella this is the cortex and what you see here of intermediate signal intensity this is the entire patellar cartilage this is the trochlear cartilage so if you see this this is very homogeneous cartilage without any tear 
But when you see a focal hyperintensity in the cartilage like this, this is a grade one signal. While when you see a fissures in the cartilage, which are extending up to less than 50% of its depth, this is grade two injury. When the fissures are extending for more than 50%, it is grade three. And when it is extending full thickness and associated with subchondral bone marrow edema or cystic changes in bone, this is the grade four injury. So this is how the cartilage injuries are graded from grade zero to grade four. Where zero is normal, grade four is the full thickness injury. So this appearance, again, there is very much uh, <clears throat> known appearance, particularly in young individual, where you see an osteochondral fragment at the lateral aspect of medial femoral condyle. And this is known as the osteochondritis desiccans. This usually occurs with chronic injuries or on end of micro trauma, which results in this osteochondral fracture. And it is graded again, depending on what is the uh, appearance of this fragment. If there is only subchondral injury, it is grade one. If there is partial detachment of the fragment, it is grade two. If you see complete detachment like here, it is grade three, but it is still in place. And if you this is displaced from its normal site and lying some down somewhere here, then it is the grade four osteochondritis desiccans. Then it acts like a loose body like here. It's displaced from its normal site. So that is the grade four OCD. Degenerative changes, uh, again, a very common appearance in elderly with almost there is here. You can see the lateral femoral condyle cartilage, but in medial femoral condyle, there is no cartilage left at all. This is the complete loss of cartilage at medial femoral condyle. In the outer part, the lateral tibia, medial tibial cartilage is also lost. And there are subchondral bone marrow edematous changes. And this is the appearance of degenerative osteoarthritic changes. Bone contusions, as I said previously, bone contusions are very well seen on MR. So this patient who has multiple bone contusions, if you see his radiograph or even CT scan, it will be completely normal. But these contusions can be severely painful. So MR can detect such kind of bone contusions, which are not still fractures, but that can be the reason of, the reason of patient's pain. Or you can see the fracture like here, <clears throat> what we see on a radiograph or a CT scan. What, when, uh, <clears throat> when you see a specific pattern of bone contusion like here, here is a contusion at the anterolateral aspect of lateral femoral condyle and inframedial aspect of patella. This is the classical appearance of transient lateral patellar dislocation. So <clears throat> when the patella dislocates laterally and then come back to its normal position. It is usually associated with MPFL or uh, injury also, that is medial patellofemoral ligament or medial patellar retinaculum injury also. So it will come here and come back. And in the meantime, it will cause contusions at the femur and patella. And this is the appearance of transient lateral patellar dislocation. It can be even associated with the focal cartilage injury also. So whenever you see a specific pattern of bone contusions, like uh, when you see contusion at the posterior aspect of lateral tibial plate 2 and mid part of lateral femoral condyle, this is the contusion of pivot shift injury. When you see this contusion, think about ACL tear. Similarly, when you see a dashboard kind of injury, that is uh, common with the PCL tear. When you see contusion at the anterior aspect of tibia, then always look for PCL injury more carefully. Similarly, hyperextension injury where casing contusions at the anterior aspect of tibial plate 2 and femoral condyle or valgus injury when contusion at the lateral femoral condyle. So these contusions, they act as a footprint of the soft tissue injury. So when you see a contusion which are classical for pivot shift injury, you have to look more carefully for the ACL as well as MCL and the meniscus because they are more likely to injure in this pattern of injury. So when you see such injury, this is the pivot shift injury, look for ACL. When you see such kind of injury, which is the dashboard injury, look for PCL and you might see a complete tear of posterior cruciate ligament. Lastly, when you see such heterogeneous appearance, particularly in a young child, this is not bone contusion. This patient may not have any history of injury. This is not even bone marrow abnormality also. This is just normal heterogeneous appearance because of the presence of red marrow. And this is very common in young individual. And you should not mistake this as a abnormality or any marrow infiltrative disorder. Lastly, briefly about tendons. There are multiple tendons, mainly the quad quadriceps tendon and patellar tendon. These two are most important. And you can see them nicely in the sagittal plane. Here is the complete tear of quadriceps tendon. Here is the partial tear of the patellar tendon that you can see uh, very clearly with the help of MR. Always look for joint effusion for Baker's cyst, for new loose bodies or plica, like here. There is a 
fluid collection in the anterior aspect in the subcutaneous tissue overlying the patella and this is the appearance of prepatellar bursitis. Here is the similar significant joint effusion with synovial hypertrophy and this hypertrophied synovium has areas of fat within that and this is the appearance of lipoma arborescence. While here again there is significant synovial hypertrophy with joint effusion with some areas of erosion and if you look at this gradient images there are areas of blood products within this and this is classical appearance of pigmented villonodular synovitis or PVNS. Even in tuberculosis, you might see such kind of synovial hypertrophy with erosions, but this areas of hemosiderin will not be there in cases of tuberculosis. This is how you can differentiate. So as I said, keep check. Uh, check. So uh, follow a proper protocol so that you look at each and every structure and you don't miss on any of the pathology. So it is very much important to have a systemic approach to avoid missing of the any lesion. And always look carefully for the lesion. Always keep in mind about the normal variants or mimics of tear so that you don't misdiagnose a normal structure as a tear. Thank you so much. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to take those. Yes, students, if you have any question, you can write your question in the chat box. Yes, sir. Uh, the question is there. Can grade 2 ACL tear with bone avulsion can heal like PCL? Uh, yes. Avulsion injuries of anterior cruciate ligament can heal on itself because ultimately it is a small fracture. If it is not significantly displaced, then that fracture fragment can heal with a rest and that patient can be treated conservatively because the ligament itself is intact. It is actually just a fracture which has resulted in symptoms of the ACL injury. So that can heal on itself without any intervention or any surgery. For MR, why knee should be placed in external rotation? We are keeping it in little external rotation mainly to straighten the anterior cruciate ligament so that we see the ACL better. Otherwise, sometimes the ACL is so much oblique that it becomes more difficult to visualize it in a sagittal image, even on one or two images. So a little external rotation is preferred. That is the only reason. Again, it is not mandatory, with particularly when we are doing this uh, 3D sequences on all that. Uh, it is not mandatory. You can even keep it in the neutral position also if patient is comfortable in that way. A Baker's cyst, yes, I didn't keep a case of Baker's cyst, but uh, Baker's cyst is actually a fluid collection, which is between the two tendons at the posteromedial aspect. If I have some axial image, maybe I can show. So this is a Baker's cyst, okay. If you look carefully, the joint fluid can go out between the two tendons and that it can accumulate here. So this is a small Baker's cyst. Similarly, it can be large also. So this is the Baker's cyst, how it looks like. Is myositis ossificans, which investigation is preferable? For myositis ossificans, the most important investigation is probably a radiograph only. You can even see calcification on radiograph. MR can be very much misleading in cases of myositis ossificans. And MRI, it might look like a big tumor because MR is not a very good modality to detect calcification. CT scan is much better to see for calcification. So whenever there is suspected myositis ossificans, it is good to take help of either a radiograph or a CT scan rather than only doing one MRI. Because there will be significant edema associated with that. So that edema and the soft tissue, it looks like a tumor. But if you do a CT scan, you will see multiple areas of calcification and then your job is very much easier that this is a myositis ossificans, particularly if you have the proper history. Can grade two meniscal tear be signal of further tear? Any precaution should be taken? No, grade 2, as I said, when there is horizontal tear or a horizontal grade 2 signal and associated with a paramenisical cyst, <clears throat> it can be termed as the <clears throat> grade 2 tear. Uh, there is nothing like to take precaution, but if you see a meniscal hyperintensity with paramenisical cyst, then it can be at least 
some weight bearing can be reduced for some time but otherwise the grade one and grade two meniscal signals are more of a degenerative changes in the meniscus and they are not the tear and it's not that once there is grade one signal it will always progress to a grade two and grade three it's just like mucoid degeneration of the meniscus which occurs with the age and it can remain remain stable also how to differentiate between ocd and fracture uh, the most important thing is if it is osteochondral fracture usually there will be a history of trauma in ocd there will not be an history of trauma because it is a chronic injury which is with repetitive micro trauma in case of acute fracture there will be associated bone marrow edema so adjacent to the site of fracture you will see significant bone marrow edema in cases of uh, fracture but in case of ocd you might not see bone marrow edema adjacent to it i think i have stopped the screen sharing so that i showed that a uh, baker cyst but you might not have seen it just show it again okay can you see now so this is the appearance of baker cyst this is the baker cyst which is a fluid which is extending between the two tendon and posteriorly you can see a small collection it can be even large also it usually communi communicates with the joint this is the baker cyst okay any other question uh, when can ct scan and mri be prescribed usually for all whenever you are suspecting any soft tissue injury mr is better ct scan is mainly when there is comminuted bony fractures like a tbl condyle fracture with depression when the surgery is planned and when you want to look for the bony fragments how they are placed when the fracture is all, all almost always evident on a radiograph and we want to see further details of the fracture then ct scan is better or when when we want to see a calcified loose body or when as i said we want to see this myositis ossificans then ct scan is better otherwise for almost all conditions mri is much better than ct scan for knee joint okay is there any question i think uh, sir has explained a very good way about how to see the mri of the knee joint because we are not looking the mri very frequently in our day to day clinics so yes it's uh, very difficult but now onwards whenever we see we try to find out uh, if uh, any kind of the injury or whatever it is written into the report just we have to correlate exactly we are able to make it out actually where is the structure uh, the thing is uh, to have a repeated look once you yeah that is the only thing uh, that repeatedly we have to see you will be able to make out the injury yes yeah. yes uh, now is there any question from the student side okay fine uh, yes uh, tomorrow the session uh, will be there the same that is uh, 11 o'clock and the mri of the shoulder joint so yes please everybody just read the basics about the shoulder so you can better understand about the mri of the shoulder too so thank you very much for the sparing your valuable time and the sharing your valuable knowledge too thank you thank you very much sir in pattern or something you can just convey me so that i can uh, take it according because in this online meeting it is not if it is like not definitely possible. sir yeah so, whether they are understanding or not or am i going too fast or slow or yeah no sir the pace is very good but there might be other yeah, sometimes if uh, like we are conversation in front then might be their question is more and so yeah. yes if they have any question yes yeah tomorrow they will ask about the spine about the knee anyway if sure. they read something about it okay Okay, okay, sir. Thank you very much.